Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, for your information, I'm going to be sharing my time today with the member from Calgary Centre. Madam Speaker, I'm honoured today to speak on Bill C-15, as the relationship with Indigenous people in this country is a lived experience for me growing up and living in Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. I must admit, there is some trepidation on my part as we embark on this journey. The impacts of this bill are both long-term and far-reaching, requiring more than the seeking of short-term political gains and talking points. The historic relationship between the federal government and Indigenous people in this country is filled with distrust that has put in jeopardy the true potential our great country has to offer all of us. A couple of months ago in the announcement that the government would not fulfill its promise to end boil water advisories in First Nations communities, it was pointed out that the scope of the problem was not fully understood at the time the election promise was made by the Prime Minister in 2015. This is another reminder to all of us that making promises you cannot keep is not an ideal way to develop trust in a relationship that badly needs more of it. In a Globe and Mail article published recently, it was pointed out that the Public Services and Procurement Canada Ministry for the past three years has said that a key indicator of the government's economic and social policy goals was to increase the participation of Indigenous-led business in procurement. Unfortunately, it was revealed in the departmental plans in the last three years that the targets have remained as TBD, to be determined. That's three years, Madam Speaker, that we have seen no change in the ministry's plans to set targets or measure results. Even worse to this day, there is not even a mechanism in place to track which bids are coming from Indigenous businesses. If the government's goal only was to increase procurement for Indigenous businesses, you would think that at the very least, creating an instrument in their data management system could have been developed in three years. At best, Madam Speaker, this is an astounding lack of competence. Further evidence of lowering the bar was in the Minister's 2021 mandate letter, where there was not even a mention of the 5% Indigenous procurement promise that had been made to Indigenous businesses in the past. Instead of doing the hard work and fixing the department's failures, they just removed the targets. Not exactly an example that you would find in a leadership manual. These examples illustrate a troubling trend with this government's actions when it comes to delivering results for Indigenous people and their communities. It starts with making election promises and getting photographs at press conferences. It continues by using phrases in ministerial letters on websites and in announcements like strongly encourages and the most important relationship to this government. It then ends with walking back the original promise, changing the targets, or in the case of the procurement example, eliminating them altogether. Madam Speaker, this government tends to act only when they have their backs to the wall, after spending too much time walking backwards while making little progress on their promises. We see this again, Madam Speaker, today in the fact that they have to invoke closure on a bill that's seen one hour of date debate in this House prior to them invoking closure. Finally, this brings me to Bill C-15. After Bill C-262, this government had ample opportunity and time to develop a national action plan that could have created the certainty and the clarity that stakeholders have been consistently asking for. Putting together an action plan before tabling the bill would have allowed for many of the concerns of people across the spectrum to be addressed. The worry that government is putting the cart before the horse is justified, as history has proven that to be the case all too often. Why would we not ensure on such an important piece of legislation that we remove as many rocks off the road as possible before we proceed? That approach would alleviate a lot of the judicial quagmire that is sure to follow up by passing Bill C-15 without this transparent roadmap. With no certainty, Madam Speaker, the very real worry is that there will be many court battles over the next few decades because of political short-sightedness. And as we have seen this past year with the Nova Scotia lobster fishery issue, that is a path not worth taking. In this relationship, Madam Speaker, we cannot afford more failures. We have to be honest. Governments have a terrible track record on delivering expectations for Indigenous people. Let me use some numbers that the Indigenous Resource Network shared recently to show who has not in fact fallen short in delivering for Indigenous people and communities in this country. Madam Speaker, the private sector has led the way in spending on Indigenous businesses. 
Suncor spent over $6 billion on indigenous procurement since 1999, including 800 million or 8% of its total spending in 2019 alone. Sonova spent 2.9 billion since 2009, including 139 million in 2019. Imperial invested 2.6 billion in indigenous businesses since 2009. Diamond Mines in the Northwest Territory spent $5.9 billion on Indigenous spending between 1996 and 2017. Agnico Eagle in Nunavut spent $408 million on Inuit businesses in 2019 alone. Tech Resources spent $225 million on Indigenous procurement in 2019. Coastal GasLink has spent $720 million on Indigenous and local contracts. TMX, when it is completed, will have generated over $1 billion on Indigenous-based contracts. And finally, from their own published data, Cameco, a uranium company procured $3.85 billion since 2004 from local suppliers in my riding in Northern Saskatchewan, Madam Speaker. These numbers represent more than just dollars. They represent real outcomes, and direct impacts on the daily lives of Indigenous people. They allow for investments into communities who have far too long been left out of the opportunities the rest of Canada has enjoyed. It is often implied that any discussion around economic opportunity and job creation for Indigenous people is somehow insensitive to the social issues they face. Madam Speaker, I believe the opposite is actual, actually true. Advocating for jobs, own source revenue streams, equity ownership, and financial independence is in fact the pathway to self-determination and the solution to many of the social challenges. Madam Speaker, the culture of poverty has for too long defined the culture of the people. A culture with such rich history deserves so much better. The private sector has done the heavy lifting in the building of trust with Indigenous people and their communities, and they've done this for years. They should be recognized and applauded for the advancement of reconciliation and for the role they have played in it. Part of that recognition should be reflected in their voices being heard in the areas of this bill that they're simply seeking clarity on. Since Bill C-15 was tabled, I've had the opportunity and the pleasure to meet virtually with many, many Indigenous stakeholders. The common theme in our discussions always came back to the lack of certainty in Bill C-15's plan to implement UNDRIP. It is why it is so important that this bill clarifies the following issues. Number one, Madam Speaker, in the three years that this government has given itself to develop an action plan on the implementation of the declaration, what is the approach going to be to collaborating and consulting with Indigenous communities the Indigenous business community, and the numerous regional and national organizations across Canada so that all their views will be considered. Number two, how will the application of the declaration be applied when there's conflicting support and opposition from the Indigenous communities on projects that are both large and vertical in scope? Does the federal government retain the final authority in the decision-making process? Number three, will not allowing time and space for Indigenous communities to find an answer to the question of who has the authority to provide or withhold consent undermine the process. With the current lack of consensus, what does this mean in the years ahead? Madam Speaker, bringing clarity on these issues is the right thing to do. There is a responsibility in the consideration of Bill C-15 that requires us to not only listen to the concerns around the lack of certainty, but to respond by advocating for Indigenous people communities and leaders who are asking for answers to the important questions they are bringing forward. Madam Speaker, we have a long way to go in building the lost trust in the relationship with Indigenous people in this country. Divisions within Parliament have often led to legislation that is based more on politics than real solutions. That is why, Madam Speaker, it is obvious that seeking clarity and that seeking certainty on Bill C-15 is not only a fair and valid request, it is the very essence of what the aspirations of UNDRIP require us to do. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary of the Government House Leader. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And I think that it's important that we be really clear. The, the, the Conservative Party say what they will during a debate. Uh, there 
actual intentions would be not to allow the legislation ultimately to come uh, to a vote. Um, we have seen that on other types of, of legislation. And even though they might talk uh, nice in regards to reconciliation and, and so forth, their actions on this particular piece of legislation, as it was on 262, uh, is actually says more than what their words do. And I'm wondering if the member could provide a very clear indication as to why it is that the Conservatives, at the very least, wouldn't have recognized the value of allowing this uh, to come to a vote, so at the very least it could go to committee. The Honourable Member for Desnete, Missinippi, Churchill River. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I, I thank the, the member opposite for, for his question, but let's, let's just be clear in, in the question he's asking. This legislation is already at committee. It's been at committee for weeks already as we were required to do a pre-study of this legislation at the INAN committee. So maybe we should actually let some facts do the talking. As I said in my comments, Madam Speaker, I've had the opportunity to speak to many Indigenous stakeholders. And what I've heard and what I understand is there are many of them who have not, not had the opportunity to have their input into this legislation. They've asked to come to committee. They've sent letters asking to be at committee, but this member's government limited the amount of time and the number of meetings that we could listen to the evidence at committee. And so for him to talk about the conservatives obstructing the process is literally quite a folly, Madam Speaker. It's actually the liberals who have obstructed the process for us to hear from the voices at committee. Questions and comments, the honorable member for Timmins, James Bay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I represent a very large natural resources region, and we know there are no projects that get off the ground without Indigenous consent. It is now a fundamental principle. And that issue of consent is important because it's not just about saying yes, but it is also about the ability to say no when a project has fundamental problems that threat the environment of a traditional territory. And I know from the days when we used to, when I was working with the Algonquin Nation in Quebec, where we actually had to have blockades to get anyone to come to the table. We're talking about a fundamental principle, a principle that has been defined in court case after court case, a principle that the issue of consent is fundamental when we're talking about resource development in Canada. And I would encourage the Conservatives to recognize that if they're willing to work with First Nation communities, we're going to move a lot further ahead. But we've seen obstructions year in, year out against UNDRIP. UNDRIP needs to pass before we can move together as a nation. The Honourable Member for Desnete, Missinippi, Churchill River. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and in all fairness, Madam Speaker, I, I couldn't agree with the, the, the member more. Um, as I said in my comments, would not have allowing time and space for the Indigenous communities to find an answer to the question of who has the authority to, pro to provide or withhold consent undermine the process. What I've heard from the stakeholders, many of them Indigenous organizations representing opportunity for Indigenous people whose mandate is to end poverty on First Nations, is their concern about the uncertainty and the lack of clarity on this particular piece of legislation and how it may hinder their opportunity to fulfill their mandate of serving their people on First Nations across this country. Time for a brief question. Uh, the Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Oh, no, uh, the Honourable Member for Fredericton. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I, I thank the member for his comments today. Um, I just want to ask quickly about some of the words that we use. Language is so important, and reconciliation has been said time and time again in this House. Um, and, it, you know, I've heard from many people that feel that this word is actually losing some of its meaning. And in fact, if we think of reconciliation as to reconcile, to improve what was perhaps once a good relationship, which we know that was not the case. Can the member speak about perhaps reparations and what we could actually be doing in Canada to, to ensure that we repair a broken relationship? The Honourable Member for Desnete, Missinippi, Churchill River, a brief answer, please. I will try, Madam Speaker, and thank you for that question. Um, I, I'm going to simply just point out to, to the member opposite that the, the slogan of my campaign and in my riding has been building authentic relationships with people. I serve in a, a riding that's 70 percent Indigenous people, and I believe that authenticity about that being real, about having good conversation and listening to the concerns of the people, that's the answer 
to repair the relationship. We have to get out there. We have to be part of their lives. We have to listen to their concerns. We have to take them valid, you know, consider them valid. But it's about building relationships that are real and authentic. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And let me 